Good morning, friends. We are on chapter 31. Bodies are the key to the case. Santa Fe, New Mexico. In Chimeo, the heroin clan's dominance went back years. It didn't matter that members of these clans had all been arrested, as had their workers. The problem was, Chris Valdez told Jim Kukendall that none had done much prison time, then always returned home. The families grew stronger, which, with each demonstration of impunity. Still, the old cases interested Kukendall. Drugs had been seized in each case. A historical record of the clan's control existed throughout those cases. Kukendall saw there was a story to be told. Witnesses, people in prison now, users or low-rung workers who could talk about the clans, had been there when the cops barged in on one family or another. Plus, those who died from heroin overdoses could speak from the grave if only, if only their loved ones would talk. Their stories might tell best of all how deeply the clan's power resided in Chimeo. To Jim Kukendall, all this history was important, for it formed a story of the clan's control that might become the basis of a federal conspiracy case. He formed a team of local cops and targeted the main heroin-dealing de families in Chimeo, and in particular, Felix Barella, who, made, who said he made his money from cutting firewood. <laughs> a short while later, Kukendall briefed top federal agents and prosecutors. The FBI wanted to contribute agents to go up on wiretaps. Kukendall resisted. Wiretaps were unnecessary. The key to the case are the bodies, Kukendall said. They each tell a story. There's a story behind who these people are, where they bought their drugs, and how they died. We need to tell that story. He got the medical examiner's reports of dozens of overdose cases that divided and divided them among the investigators. They fanned across the Espinola Valley, interviewing families of the deceased. Years before, as black tar heroin accelerated the valley's decay, each dead junkie had been viewed as one less problem. No one had cared enough to interview their families, but the families were integral to the Chimeo heroin tale, Kukendall believed. Addicts, even those well into adulthood, often returned to live with their parents once they lost their jobs, houses, and spouses. Parents lived in torment as their children stole from them, slaves to the morphine molecule, it turned out many parents and siblings unable to withstand the torment that would ensue if they refused, and afraid if they let their family member borrow that car that it would never be seen again, had driven the addicts to their dealers' houses. These parents, it turned out, were eager to talk. They greeted the investigators with tears and hugs. They recounted watching helplessly as their kids fell apart. One mother in tears pinched Kukendall's cheeks as she made him promise he would get the people who sold her child heroin. These parents said the Barella family, as the school year approached, would hand out lists of what clothes their children needed. When they wanted new televisions or stereos, they'd let the addicts know. Soon junkies would be plying them with newly stolen pants for their kids. One afternoon, Kukendall went to visit Dennis Smith, a man in his 70s whose son Donald had died. Donald Smith had moved back to live with his father after a fight with his girlfriend over his heroin use. Sitting with Kukendall, the elder Smith said that on a trip home, from an outing one night, his son had demanded they return to Chimeo so he could buy heroin. He threatened to jump from the car if his father didn't turn around. Dennis Smith said he drove his son back to the Barella compound, a place where he had taken him several times before. The elder Smith turned the car around and headed back to the Barellas for his kid's dope. He found his son's corpse in the trailer in the back of his property the next morning. One resident, George Royball, told the detectives that he often took his disabled brother Ernie to buy dope from the Barellas and the Mar Martinez's. Another, Lynette Salazar, told them she took her son Armando to a clan house, as she had done often, to trade auto supplies for a hit of dope, and from this Armando died later that day. Kukendall flew to Montana to visit a woman who had driven through the valley one fall. Enchanted with its natural beauty, she decided to stay. She moved in right next to a member of the Martinez clan. At first, she told Kukendall she believed her next-door neighbor, Jesse Donuts Martinez, was a Boy Scout leader from all the youths who would visit the house all afternoon. Soon, though, she saw kids with belts around their arms. Her young son began finding syringes in the yard. She called the cops and began noting every car that pulled up, 30 a day sometimes. She spent a year watching junkies coming in and out, shooting up in the backyard in full view of her window. She called police repeatedly. Finally, she gave up and moved to Montana. In the end... The case against the clans involved relatively few undercover drug buys. It revolved instead around testimony of people whom Kukendall and the agents had tracked down. The families and friends of the dead told their stories to a grand jury, with Kukendall finishing up to recount the history of heroin in the valley and the clan's control. 
the grand jury indicted 34 people, including Felix Barella, Josefa Gallegos, Fat Jose Martinez, and his brother Donuts. At 6 a.m. on Wednesday, September 29, 1999, a five-mile caravan of law enforcement officers rolled into Chimeo as three helicopters buzzed like dragonflies across the skies. They seized land and motorcycles and Felix Barella's beloved lowrider, the Wizard. Two months later, they seized his prized sorrel racehorse, Red Hot Mag, which his trainer had secreted out of the state, but brought back to race at the Sunray Racetrack in Farmington. After the horse won the eighth race, Kukadal and his Asian agents stopped the jockey, leaving the track, produced a judge's order, and confiscated the horse. They went to the track office and seized the $22,000 in prize money as well. They later auctioned Red Hot Mag for $15,000. Fifteen acres of the Barella compound, where hundreds of addicts once used to buy, was deeded to the Boys and Girls Club. Without land, the clans had no base of operations. Even after leaving prison, they did not return to Chimeo. But the story of the Chimeo clans is important to our own because months before that bust, in April 1999, Jim Kukendall and his newly deputized agents sifted through the clan's history. A body turned up in Santa Fe, a 21-year-old Mexican kid named Aurelio Rodriguez Zapita from the small town of Jalisco in the state of Nayarit, was found in the trunk of a car, beaten and bloody. In the town of Jalisco, Nayarit, the town of Jalisco, Nayarit meant nothing to the agents at the time, other than it ironically happened to be the sister city to nearby Teos, New Mexico. Nor was the kid's murder especially intriguing, but the car in which Rodrigo Zapita was found was regi registered to Josefa Gallegos, the heroine matriarch of Chimeo, so they stuck with it. As it happened, Rodriguez Zapita was found with a cellular phone. The agents plugged the numbers plugged the numbers found in the phone into a federal law enforcement database. One number turned up as connected to another heroin case that the FBI was investigating in Phoenix. Kukendall called the FBI in Phoenix and spoke to an agent named Gary Woodling. Woodling had a strange story to tell. He was part of a group of agents tracking black tar heroin traffickers from the state of Nayarit, New Mexico. From Phoenix, these traffickers had set up a retail heroin cells across the United States in mid-major towns. Three Nayarit brothers ran the Phoenix cell and seemed to have decided that whatever U.S. wherever U.S. air flew from Phoenix would make a good heroin outpost. These were not the traditional drug hubs of, say, Philadelphia, Miami, or Chicago. Instead, Woodling said, Nayarit's were going to towns like Boise, Salt Lake, Omaha, Denver, Pittsburgh, even Billings, Montana a local narc in Boise named Ed Rupplinger. In fact, had already run a sizable investigation into some of these guys, Woodling, Woodling told him. Kukadal and his agents went back and combed the subpoenaed phone records for the heroin clans of Chimeo. From the records, it seems that when the clan wanted to order supplies, they called a central number, apparently a dispatcher. This dispatcher, the records show, then quickly called the number for Aurelio Rodriguez Cepeda. It seems the dead kid was some kind of black tar delivery man being sent regularly to supply the Chimeo dealers. Kukendall and the agents had long assumed that those who supplied the Chimeo heroin clans were an isolated group of Mexican dealers who had stumbled into the fertile heroin terrain of the Espanola Valley. Woodling dispelled this notion. As the investigation went into Galgosis, the Barellas and the Martinez's drew to a close and five miles of police cars streamed into Chimeo that day in September 1999. Kukendall and his investigators knew they were onto something big. Have a good day, friends.